Welcome back to Hardware Unbox. Today is the big day. We can now share with you lots of information about AMD's upcoming Ryzen 3000 CPUs and Navi GPUs, including the big news of a 16 core processor and two GPU announcements. On top of that, there's new software features, architecture details to discuss, and more so, I'll try to summarize this mountain of information in the best way possible. And there should be some tidbits that weren't covered in AMD's recent E3 live stream. So definitely worth watching the whole thing if you are interested in these things. Let's start with the 16 core CPU called the Ryzen 9 3950X. With one swift slide among a mountain in their press decks, AMD blew a big chiplet sized hole in our guesses from Computex a few weeks back, where we said AMD might hold off on this chip until next year. We were a little short on the month in the end. The CPU isn't launching with the other Ryzen 3000 series products, but will be available in September of this year. We did get basic specifications, 16 cores, 32 threads, 3.5 gigahertz base clock, 4.7 gigahertz boost clock, 72 megabytes of cache, and a 105 watt TDP to match AMD's other high-end CPUs. Again, TDP isn't a great metric for comparisons here because all of the 3800X, 3900X, and 3950X are sitting at 105 watts. So we'll have to wait for Steve's review to see real power consumption figures. AMD didn't reveal pricing information during the tech day, instead leaving that for the live stream. We made this video before the live stream, so most of you will probably already know what the 16 core will cost. If you didn't catch that, we'll leave a pinned comment below with the details. Now that we have the full Ryzen 3000 picture with all the SKUs, as expected, the initial leaks were pretty much too good to be true. We didn't end up getting a 16 core part at over 5 gigahertz with a price tag under $500. But what AMD is actually delivering in the end is still very impressive, bringing 16 cores to the mainstream desktop platform in a package that's suitable for both creators and gamers is nothing to sneeze at, especially given the position AMD's CPU division was in just a few years ago. Personally, we weren't sure whether AMD would release the 16 core part this year or keep it in the bag for next year. We had a few theories that AMD would strategically hold this part back, but like a lot of guesses, you don't get everything right. Of course, as we mentioned in our recap video, the 16 core part was always possible. We never really doubted its existence, but the launch has come a bit earlier than we anticipated given the state of Intel's CPU division. We have a lot more Zen 2 information here as well, so I'll run through the key points in dot point form, and then we'll talk GPUs a little bit later. So with Zen 2, there's lower memory latency assisted by doubled L3 cache, which delivers up to 21% improvements in 1080p gaming going on AMD's numbers. AMD showed the Ryzen 9 3900X, so the 12 core part, trading blows with the Core i9-9900K in gaming at 1080p. Losses in titles like Devil May Cry 5 and Overwatch, but wins in CSGO and PUBG. Of course, the 12 core part is much better in a number of creator-focused workloads as well, although gains are limited to around 14% in handbrake according to AMD, but larger gains in other tasks. Similar story for the Ryzen 7 3800X versus the Core i7-9700K in 1080p gaming, trading blows, although perhaps a little slower in this relative comparison. Interestingly, this wasn't a 3800X versus 9900K comparison, although the 3800X is priced much closer to the 9700K, which is why they've chosen that battle. The 3600X is shown again trading blows with its competitor, Intel's 6 core Core i5 9600K, but it pulls away more substantially in creative workloads where the 9600K is a bit limited. All three chips are shown to be more efficient in AMD's testing as you'd expect. For the platform, we have a number of cool features. Straight off the CPU are 24 PCIe 4.0 lanes, four of which are reserved for the X570 chipset. 16 lanes are then for graphics and four for NVMe devices directly attached to the CPU. The X570 chipset supports 12 flexible PCIe 4.0 lanes out of it with the configuration varying depending on the board. So this could mean as many as three PCIe 4.0 drives through the chipset or two PCIe drives and four SATA devices, etc. You can see all the configurations here. Memory overclocking capabilities are supposedly excellent with this new generation. DDR4 3200 is the officially supported spec, however AMD are claiming they've achieved DDR4 5100 on air thanks to their new memory controller design. We heard at Computex that DDR4 4000 and above should be easily achievable on all Ryzen CPUs, with mid 4000 clocks doable without anything crazy, hence why many boards support above DDR4 4400. 
However, AMD claims that the sweet spot for performance will be DDR4 3733 with the Infinity Fabric tying to the memory clock at a 1 to 1 ratio up to that point. Beyond that, it switches into a 2 to 1 mode. So the raw memory latency for DDR4 4400 is actually below that of DDR4 3200. That'll mean that for some workloads, the higher performance memory will be more suitable. And for others, potentially gaming, you might want to keep it below that 3733 mark. We'll have to test that to find which are the best memory configurations for various workloads. Overclocking support for the CPU is also improved thanks to a better version of Ryzen Master. On top of that, Precision Boost Overdrive now delivers up to 200 megahertz of automatic overclocking should you enable the feature and have good enough cooling. AMD did divulge quite a lot of information on the Zen 2 architecture specifically. Most of this stuff is beyond the normal scope of the channel, so if you are interested in the nitty gritty architecture details, I suggest heading over to Anantech or a source like that who often do a fantastic job of covering the architecture. That said, I'll show the summary slide here where you can see features like an improved branch predictor, larger L3 cache, larger micro up cache, doubled floating point capabilities, and improved integer processing with most areas of the design increasing in size. One thing that will interest you guys is the CCX layout of each chiplet. Some speculated one chiplet would be one 8-core CCX, however there are actually two 4-core 8-thread CCXs per chiplet die. Thanks to 7 nanometers, every CCX is 47% smaller though, with great scope for scaling. The Windows 10 May 2019 update is optimized for Zen as well, taking clock selection times from 30 milliseconds down to just 1 to 2 milliseconds, which allows for faster clock ramping with Ryzen 3000. We're also getting better topology awareness for the CCX design, and this gives up to a 15% improvement to performance just from the Windows update. All Ryzen 7 and Ryzen 9 processors come with the Wraith Prism cooler as well, if you like using the box cooler, including that top-end Ryzen 9 processor. Okay, that's most of the interesting CPU and Ryzen 3000 related stuff out of the way. Let's move into some Navi discussion. AMD are today announcing the Radeon RX 5700 series, which encompasses two GPUs, the RX 5700 XT and the RX 5700. These are the only GPUs AMD are announcing at this stage, so if you're hoping for a big 2080 Ti killer or a flagship to take on Nvidia, you'll have to wait a bit longer. The RX 5700 XT is the faster of the two cards, offering 40 compute units for a total of 2560 stream processors, up to 9.75 teraflops of performance, up to a 1905 megahertz boost clock, and 8 gigabytes of GDDR6 clocked at 14 gigabits on a 256-bit bus for 448 gigabytes per second of bandwidth. You'll also see here a game clock of 1755 megahertz. This is the clock AMD expects the card to run at in typical games, with a boost clock more of a top-end figure. 64 ROPS here and 256 text units as well. Then we have the Radeon RX 5700 which cuts the compute unit figure down to 36, meaning we have 2304 stream processors. The boost and game clock are lower at 1725 and 1625 megahertz respectively, however the memory, ROP and texture unit configuration is the same as the XT model. TDPs are a little on the high side still, the 5700 XT is rated at 225 watts and the 5700 at 180 watts. While performance and efficiency could be a big step in the right direction, AMD are pitting the 225 watt 5700 XT up against Nvidia's RTX 2070 which is a 175 watt card which indicates that their efficiency still isn't quite there at the level of Nvidia. I'll blast you here with some of AMD's performance numbers, of course take these with a grain of salt given we haven't tested the cards yet. Across a series of games, many of which do reasonably well on AMD hardware, AMD has the 5700 XT around 30% ahead of Vega 56 and 5% ahead of the RTX 2070, although it does lose to the RTX 2070 in Shadow of the Tomb Raider for example at 1440p. Meanwhile the RX 5700 is around 10% faster than the RTX 2060 at 1440p. As with the 16 core Ryzen CPU, I don't have pricing information provided ahead of time, but I'm expecting that to have been already unveiled during the live stream. Again, we'll have that info in the pinned comment below, and we'll refrain from making any value judgments just yet because we really don't know where it will stack up. Hopefully it will sound decent, and we do expect, of course, mid-range type pricing for this. Again, July shelf date for the cards, but no exact launch date at this stage. Of course, there is more Navi information to go through. First up, you'll have noticed the blower design 
design used once again for the reference models. A few of you will be disappointed that AMD aren't going with the triple fan open air solution of the Radeon 7, but we are looking at an aluminium shroud and backplate. There's an acoustically tuned contour in the cooler, and the 5700 XT has a seven phase VRM that's overclocking ready and supports power through an eight and six pin connector. Another big addition for monitor fans is an upgraded Radeon display engine with display stream compression 1.2a support. This means up to 4K at 240Hz is supported, as is 4K 144Hz through a single cable. Although these cards don't support HDMI 2.1. AMD also showed off the first display with DSC support from ASUS, a 43-inch 4K 144Hz model with display HDR1000 capabilities, all through a single cable, so that is pretty neat. Okay, let's talk some Navi architecture stuff now, in particular RDNA, since there's been a lot of discussion on what this means. Again, a lot of the stuff AMD talked about is beyond our normal scope, so check out Anantec and others for more in-depth information, but there are a few interesting tidbits in here. With RDNA, the compute unit has been redesigned to allow for better performance and efficiency, so it's not just a simple copy of GCN or a slight evolution here. AMD claims reduced execution latency, better single thread performance, improved cache design, and better resource pooling through a 2CU workgroup design. The multi-level cache hierarchy in particular brings huge gains to bandwidth in some areas, plus reduced latency compared to GCN. All of this allows for around 25% more performance per clock, and this performance gain raises to 50% when AMD compares GCN and RDNA in a same power, same configuration scenario, of which a significant chunk is down to 7 nanometers. When comparing AMD's 14 nanometer GCN GPU at 495 square millimeters in Vega 64 compared to their new 7 nanometer Navi GPU at 251 square millimeters, Navi has 14% better performance and consumes 23% less power for a total performance per watt gain of 1.5x. And interestingly, with such a huge size disparity, you'd have to wonder what AMD could do with, say, 80 compute units. Hopefully we see something like that in the future because it could really challenge NVIDIA's top-end GPUs. The Radeon Multimedia Engine has been upgraded to support VP9 decoding at up to 8K24 and 4K90, plus HEVC encoding at 4K60 and decoding at 4K90. Will be interesting to see how this fares for game streamers who want to use AMD's engine here for quick encoding of their gameplay. As for ray tracing, both Sony and Microsoft has announced that their consoles will support ray tracing in some form using Navi GPUs. However, Navi for desktop PCs will not include any hardware level ray tracing support. Instead, that will be supported at a shader level with next gen RDNA, aka RDNA 2, set to integrate it on a hardware level. Whether or not this means next gen consoles are also using next gen RDNA GPUs, we're not really sure on that one for now. As for next-gen RDNA, that is currently codenamed RDNA2, as I just mentioned, and will hit us before 2021 on 7 nanometer plus. Obviously, AMD isn't ready to give more information on that. But wait, there's more. We're also getting a slew of new software features in Radeon Software Adrenaline 2019 edition version 19.7.1. Yep. That is a long official name, but it will be available on July 7th. Aside from the usual UI and settings improvements, AMD are introducing new features such as display aware tuning, a mode that sets frame rate caps to match the monitor refresh rate, which has a range of benefits. There's also Radeon Anti-Lag, which aims to improve click to response times in esports titles by better timing and optimizing the CPU and GPU output in games. More interesting than that is Radeon image sharpening. To me, this is far more compelling than NVIDIA's DLSS technology. For starters, it's a post-processing effect with little to no performance impact. It uses contrast adaptive sharpening to improve image quality, and it can be combined with optional GPU upscaling to form a DLSS type solution where you run at a sub-native resolution to improve performance, then sharpen it back up to a near native presentation. Given that unlike DLSS, the sharpening phase isn't performance intensive, AMD says about a 1% performance drop, this tech has the potential to deliver the same performance benefits of DLSS with better image quality. And just to rub it into a video further, AMD says this new feature is supported in thousands of games, not just the handful that DLSS does. In other words, it doesn't sound like it requires developer integration, which is a huge benefit of this technology.
However, to access this feature, you will need an RX 5700 series GPU. Developers can also integrate a similar feature into games natively if they'd like through AMD's new Fidelity FX open source program that is aiming to work on better post-processing effects like this. Finally, AMD also unveiled two new APUs. Bit of a low-key unveil to be honest, but I guess that's what happens when you've also got Zen 2 CPUs coming out. Unlike the rest of the Ryzen 3000 series, the new Ryzen 3 3200G and Ryzen 5 3400G are Zen Plus chips which bring increased clock speeds. The 3200G now sits at a 3.6 GHz base and 4.0 GHz boost on the CPU, up from 3.5 and 3.7 GHz with the 2200G. The GPU clock also goes from 1100 MHz to 1250 MHz. Then with the 3400G, the base clock also goes up by 100 MHz and the boost clock jumps from 3.9 to 4.2 GHz. GPU clock increases from 1250 MHz to 1400 MHz. Same configuration for both parts, so the Ryzen 3 is 4 cores and 4 4 threads with a Vega 8 GPU, while the Ryzen 5 is 4 cores and 8 threads with Vega 11. The 3400G also benefits from a Wraith Spire cooler in the box, new high quality metal TIM and PBO overclocking support. Unfortunately, we didn't get any launch pricing or details on this, so we really don't know when these CPUs are coming or what they'll be priced at, but we expect them to come out reasonably soon. And that's it. I think that's everything. Knowing just how much content AMD has just unleashed, I'm sure I've missed something along the way, but hopefully I've covered all the big and important details. But from all this information, you should definitely still have a much better idea of how the Ryzen 3000 series is shaping up when most CPUs launch on July 7th, as well as the first look at new Navi GPUs also launching in July. You won't want to miss our in-depth reviews for all products when they become available, so smash that subscribe button and hit the bell icon as well. Steve would really appreciate that as he prepares his benchmark cave for action. Also, you can support us on Patreon if you like our work and you'll get some cool perks in return like behind the scenes videos and access to our discord community that's it i'll see you in the next one